Well, we're putting together this uh, today's the, the presentation. We uh, thank to Robert Lowry, or Bob Lowry, the author and Indonesian analyst. It might be a good time to have a look at Indonesia, particularly its armed forces, the structure of the reform plan for the future, particularly in the light of the uh, elections that are happening recently in Indonesia. And as you know, there's quite a considerable amount of civil unrest, uh, particularly in Jakarta, in relation to the outcome of that uh, of the presidential election. It is one of the largest, but not the largest, one of the largest democracies in the world. It's also our closest largest nation, uh, neighbour. And so it's very important that we have a close look at what's happening with the Indonesian armed forces and its plans for the future. Uh, Bob had extensive experience in the Australian Army, including service in South Vietnam, Singapore and Indonesia, after he retired from the Army, he worked in Indonesia, Timor-Leste and Fiji on defence and security issues. He was the acting uh, National Director of the Australian Institute of International Affairs, Associate Director of the Australian Defence Studies Centre in 1997, Senior Analyst with the International Crisis Group in Jakarta during 2001 doing policy orientated research on military and police reform and military operations in RJ. Advisor to the Timor Leste National Security Advisor and chaired the Fiji National Security Defence Review uh, in 2004. He's also a member of the Senior Advisory Group of the Indonesian Australian Defence of Alumni and author of a number of books, including The Armed Forces of Indonesia, Fortress Fiji, and Holding the Line of the Pacific, and The Last Line of the Line of the General Sir Philip Bennett. So, would you please welcome to the podium uh, Bob Lowry, who will do a presentation for us in relation to Indonesia. I was motivated to volunteer to give this talk uh, as a result of the short article David Police had in the prior uh, United Services magazine outlining the uh, changes in Indonesian military organisations that were authorised in May last year. And I thought it would be good to put that uh, into a gen more general context, but also to motivate me to uh, actually finish an article I've been trying to write for a couple of years on forced development in Indonesia from the time they went in the of round two and until the end of this year, which is the end of the first term of President Jakarta, who has recently been re elected for, uh, for a second term. Now, I've got a few photographs in here, and I'm not going to read them out. Uh, but if there's anything on those view graphs that you don't understand, or the powerhouse, I should say, just give me a yell. Uh, otherwise, we'll take the questions at the end. Now, I was going to begin this talk with a short review of defence force development within the political era that Indonesia has experienced before concentrating on developments in the last 20 years of democracy round two. But because time is short and I want to leave time for questions, I decided to start with the basics so that you will have an understanding of how the Indonesian Armed Forces, commonly known as the TNI, are structured today in their plans for the future. Indonesia was severely affected by the 1997 Asian financial crisis that brought about the fall of Suharto in May 1998 and a return to democracy. The defence industry was hit hard, proposed acquisitions were cancelled, and the TNI was much maligned as, a, as a, the principal prop of the Suharto regime and for committing human rights abuses across the archipelago. Despite this, it was heavily committed to countering conflict that erupted as a result of the fall of the regime, and uh, its image was soon restored when President Abdul Rahman Wahid, now commonly known as Gus Dora, tried to engage the army to prevent his impeachment in 2001. Some minor acquisitions were made during these early years, most notably the four Russian uh, fighters and some helicopters. But it was not until President Cecilio Papagiliano came to power in late 2004 that internal security was stabilised and planning for the future began in earnest. And not until 2010 that additional capital was inserted into the development of the armed forces and defence industry. Turning to defence policy, the point I want to make here is that there's been no fundamental change in Indonesian defence policy and we should not expect to see it. What we have seen since late 2004 is some revitalisation 
of the formulation and implementation of policy and capability development. Indonesia has had a national government planning process since 1969 and has become more elaborate in recent years. Nevertheless, forced development is pushing uphill against budget stringency, weak ministerial oversight, maladministration and corruption, although the incidence of corruption seems to be diminishing in more recent times. For, for comparison, the GDP of Indonesia is about the same as Australia and its defence budget has yet to exceed $10 billion US. It should be noted that defence white papers don't drive policy, as they tend to do sometimes here, although people often question it. They are an expression of those elements of defence policy and strategy that the government wants to convey to domestic and foreign audiences. Beyond that, there are no public accountability documents, like an annual report to Parliament. So let's start with the uh, people. The 2008 Defence White Paper announced a freeze in regular manpower to make room for more capital expenditure, although, been, although there has been some growth in army since then. You could add an additional 50,000 public servants to the 2019 figure if you want a more complete uh, analysis of their numbers. And a big question is why there are no reserves? In a formal sense, there are some reserves provided by graduates and university regiments, retirees and specialists. But there are no formed units as such. They had some trial subunits back in the early 1990s but did not proceed with this experiment. The 2008 Defence White Paper also called for the formation of a 160,000 man general reserve to be split amongst the three services and for the formation of one territorial infantry battalion uh, the reserve battalion that is, per district. And they're now pushing to be 520 districts. So you can get some idea of the scale of manpower you're looking forward for that. But these plans were pushed back after a strategic review in 2009-2010 and doubts about the wisdom of extending military training to potential troublemakers uh, came, to, came to the fore. The expression minimum essential force was adopted by President Cecilio Don Manuelo in January 2005, soon after beginning his first term as President. It was a shorthand way of describing the deterrent force he wanted in place by 2024. The public manifestation of what this meant was provided in the 2008 Defence White Paper. It was clear that the force outlined there was an unbridled services wish list. In brief, an additional infantry battalion. Uh, an additional infantry division, those with not army, army orientation, that's somewhere between 30 and 50,000 men. Additional brigades for the territorial forces, <coughs> reserves as I've already mentioned, and a composite helicopter squadron for each of the 15 territorial commands, a 274 vessel navy, including submarines and more than 20 frigates, and nine fighter squadrons for the Air Force. This was subject to review in 2009-2010 and drastically trimmed, with the excess items being pushed back beyond 2024 and destined to be included in the ideal force along with other emerging capability requirements. Now these adjustments demonstrate that capability development is not a linear process. Threats, priorities and technological change, for example, um, can affect this. For example, SBY gave priority to capabilities that would support disaster relief after the 2004 tsunami in the, in the Indian Ocean. In addition, all of the defence white papers are predicated on higher levels of defence spending than has actually occurred. So that might be news to most of you. Also, although some of this was offset by one-off allocations as occurred under President Cecilio Bambang Unayuno's uh, second term. Opportunity buys also came along especially for the Leopard tanks, three British Corvettes that were originally destined for Brunei, 24 US F-16 fighters that were originally destined for Pakistan, and of course Australia threw in four C-130s at the later day. And serendipity also plays a role, like the switch in the source of Leopard tanks from the Netherlands to Germany, which provided more vehicles than originally sought. Now, uh, this table uh, is, is is uh, composed of three parts, and the other parts go up on the right hand side of which you're looking at. I had to split it up so that you can actually see it. 
The Army is divided into Army troops, principally helicopter squadrons, construction engineers and service battalions, into centralised commands, comprising the Army Strategic Command, commonly known in Indonesia as Kostrad, the Special Forces Command, commonly known as Kokosus, and these 15 territorial commands that cover Indonesia's 34 provinces. The establishment of the 3rd Army Strategic Command Infantry Division was authorised in May last year, and the establishment of brigades in the remaining four uh, military area commands is pending. Major replacement programs are also scheduled for obsolete vehicles, weapons, equipment, along with the creation of new capabilities in, such as cyber warfare, etc. Special Forces manpower will not be increased, but uh, qualitative improvements in accordance with separate development processes are undertaken as required. Now I must apologise to any Special Forces people who are here for putting the, for the 12 um, Special Forces battalions underneath the common variety infantry battalion and uh, column. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, it was the easiest way to just show them the size of the force. But as you can gather from this, they've got uh, quite, quite, quite a few uh, infantry returns to play. And just as an anecdote, I was in, when I was in Jakarta in 2001, I was asked at the University of Indonesia to talk about this enormous expansion in the Australian infantry. It's going to be expanded by one third from four to six infantry battalions. And this was quite disturbing in some now, as we go across here, you can see if you look at the Army Strategic Command that they're going to need uh, uh, you know, uh, two more brigades and the supporting uh, arms that go, go with that. The other thing to note is how much uh, of the supporting arms are included in this Army Regional uh, Area Command, which is spread across the archipelago. And then if we go down to the uh, Army Area Command, which has uh, covered these 34 provinces, provinces, it's obvious that with only 15 area commands, some of them cover more than one province. Where that occurs, the, the regional commands, there are 45 of them, the brigadier in charge of one of those is the link between the, uh, the military and the regional government. And then if you go down to district level, and this, districts are quite important because that is the level to which autonomy is delegated in the Indonesian system. These are the guys who actually run the country on the ground. Uh, you can see that they've got 313 uh, uh, district commands. There are actually over 500, as I mentioned earlier. And then if I was to extend that uh, further, there are about 7,000 sub-districts, and the Army's got commands in some of those, not all of them, they're probably, you know, probably about uh, a third. And then beyond that, there are 85,000 or so villages, and the Army's ideal is you have two NCOs per village. So that would be a hell of a lot of manpower. In fact, it doesn't happen, so there are only about 60,000 uh, uh, NCOs at that level, and they've got to cover those 85,000 villages. And if you, add, if you, if you divide 85,000 villages by 265 million people, that means that there are about 2,500 people uh, per village. Now, of course, if you're looking at land forces, you've also got to include the Marines. The Marines comprise three maneuver brigade groups and base defence battalions. The formation of the third brigade group was also announced last year, but it is still to be fleshed out, like that third uh, infantry division. They're scheduled to have three, over 330 uh, modern amphibious combat vehicles by 2024, which will give them the capacity to put three battalion landing teams ashore in the first wave. And it is possible that the specialised units like the Frogmen and the Reconnaissance guys will be centralised, as I'll talk about a bit later. Navy also retains its uh, uh, Special Forces Counter-Terrorist uh, Detachment. Um, and no, that, that detachment is known as the Penjaka. Now, the other thing I should explain is that we've got formation here. And they've got one to count two, so by three, so on. I don't know what to call these formations. They're just called marine forces in Indonesia. And sometimes they refer to them as divisions. And so um, those, those divisional headquarters are located in those three locations. 
But they were more, their, their function is more to allocate troops and to look after base defences, etc., rather than actually act on an operator's operational command. So they would, uh, it's, it's quite an issue for force, so it's got quite a, a deal of firepower because it's got the, you know, the normal brigade and this tank regiment, which has a tank battalion, a cavalry um, battalion, and a water transport battalion. So it's quite a large organisation uh, when you've got that and then adding the artillery engineers to go with it. And if you're looking at ground forces, you also got to include the Air Force ground troops. The Air Force ground troops comprise three wings, and some detached to were independent companies, as well as a, a counter-terrorist uh, detachment known as Team Bravo. This force is capable of seizing, defending and controlling air bases as part of broader operations. And there are also plans to boot the uh, medium and long range surface air missile capabilities in the, in the not too distant future. <coughs> Turning to the Navy, as you can see there in the, uh, in the bottom right hand side, they originally asked for 274 vessels, but because of the strategic review they did back in 19, uh, 2019, they had to reduce that. Cut back to 155. And that was done on the basis uh, that they needed 38 ships for sea control, two travel spots at once, 50 ships to put two battalion landing teams ashore at once, and also an administrative land, one, land, one uh, army battalion. They also wanted uh, 44 fast patrol boats for maritime security, in other words, to uh, pick up uh, illegal uh, activities like uh, in the fishing field smuggling and so on, and 19 support vessels. But because the 50 vessels for landing operations obviously include support vessels, I've shown those as a percentage of the ideal force, just for ease of comparison. Now having 151 ships in 2024 is not a challenge, but replacing obsolete or obsolescent vessels will be a major challenge given resource and time constraints. It uh, currently has three uh, new submarines, as you may know, from South Korea, or South Korean or origin, and two older ones acquired in 1981. And it's recently signed a contract for another three South Korean boats, but they won't come until after the 2024 time frame. It also has uh, about nine modern frigates or corvettes, and a range of fast patrol boats, and some new support vessels, in particular four landing platform docks, uh, with two more in order, and two new hydrographic come oceanographic research vessels. Maritime security is also assisted by uh, the resources of other uh, agencies and an extensive coastal and sea based radar surveillance system. The naval air wing will also comprise about 54 aircraft, although some sources of say it may be, will be more, both rotary wing and fixed wing, to support maritime combat and administrative and training functions. In the first instance, the expansion is more likely to be seen in the number of specialised aircraft allocated to squadrons than an increase in the number of squadrons, although there has been talk of forming another anti-submarine squadron in recent time. No, oh, just the Air Force. The fighter squadrons include two British Hawk squadrons, Quite as I said in the uh, late 1980s, two uh, US F 16 squadrons and one Russian SU 27, SU 30 squadron. The other squadron is awaiting the arrival of uh, 11 SU 35 fighters from Russia once the bad operations have been finalised. Upgrading Air Force capabilities is making steady yet uh, gradual progress. A new light and heavy transport squadron and a helicopter squadron are due to be formed this year. The airspace surveillance is improving with about two thirds of the NAVE radar network uh, now in place and operating effectively under the National Air Defence Command, which also integrates other national surveillance and control capabilities. <coughs> Current home bases are concentrated in the West for historical reasons, mainly related to the fact that 60% of the population in Ipso facto almost 60% of the economy is located on Java. And if you add in Sumatra, you've got 80% of the population and virtually 80% of the GDP. 
GDP as well. There's good enough reason for them to do that. A new home base will be opened at BIAC uh, this year for the new Light Transport Squadron, and an additional fighter squadron will be raised and based in Indonesia by 2024. Various locations have been suggested, like BIAC and Kupa, uh, but uh, no decision has been made as yet. So how are these forces actually commanded? Well, these uh, blue lines, two of them there, indicate that these are joint commands, and for those who don't know what joint means, it basically means that uh, if, if they're, they're run by a commander who has various degrees of authority to uh, command all forces, including Army, Navy and Air Force, within his uh, area or to the task that he's being assigned. Um, and up until uh, recent, uh, up until now, in fact, there are no standing joint commands. These, this proposal has been in the wing for many, many years. It's actually enshrined in legislation that uh, would all authorise the formation of these once the president actually signs off on another executive order to allow it to happen and the money to flush. But as of last night, they don't exist. There are no joint commands. Uh, the red lines indicate the Army area commands that cover the 34 provinces, as I said. Um, but they, I'll, I'll lift these lines here because it's useful, because there are now three fleets based in each of these areas. There are now three Air Force operation areas which are based in each of these three areas. But there's nothing to put it all together as yet. So if you want to do a joint operation, you've got to set up an ad hoc organisation to actually uh, run joint operations or allocate uh, those services to a particular army um, commander or whatever. Um, now, what does this mean in terms of the span of command? Now, I've put up here the span of command that would apply if these three joint operation owners actually existed. And it gives you a total of about 11. But as I say, they don't exist right now. So if you're going to do this with kind of arrangements, you have to put in 15 Army Area Commands and 6 uh, Navy Air Force Commands. So it gives you a span of command of about 27 operational formations. So you can see why they want these joint commands. Um, and I, I should provide a bit of sort of context for that, I suppose. There were sort of embryonic regional commands back in the in the 1950s, and then in 1969, President uh, Suharto actually formed six uh, joint commands across the archipelago. And he did this not because he needed to conduct joint operations, but he needed somewhere to park many of his contemporaries who might otherwise present political challenges to him in one form or another. They didn't have to have command forces, but they had a grand title uh, and many service. And that's that the numbers that he needed to conciliate reduced, he reduced the number to only down to four. And then after the poor showing in Timor <coughs> and uh, budgetary uh, issues, he authorised General Madani to actually downsize the command and control structure of the military in the early 1980s. They cut away all these joint commands, they reduced the number of army air force and navy commands and made it a slimmer organisation. But as uh, anybody who studies organisations know, there are always calls for it to expand to expand the organisation, to rebuild it to where it was, to lift the rank of the people that actually command it. And that's been going on. And last week, in fact, uh, the, the, the President said that he, he would be signing the authority to raise these commands in the near future. But as of last night, it's the same. It hasn't been done. The other thing I've added in, which it doesn't exist at the moment, the Maritime Defence Command. One of the things the Navy wanted to do was to raise a national fleet command, if you like, that would actually manage the, the asset the ships, the marines, the aircraft, the bases, and then allocate the ships and the resources and the effort to the three Navy fleets as directed by the principal headquarters. Uh, at the moment, that function will be done by the Navy headquarters. So if, if that's not authorised, that, that's cut out. And the other thing I'll put in, again, not authorised, the National Air Operations Command. Um, that would embrace the three Air Force Operational Commands and the National Air Defence Command and perform similar functions as the Maritime Defence Command in terms of fostering the asset and allocating resources and effort 
uh, as directed. But if, you were, if that is not raised, then you're just putting the national aid into mind. Okay, the last thing I want to uh, go through in this um, uh, presentation is uh, the question of the residual political role of the TNI. The TNI withdrew from its last formal political function in 2004. Since then, it has not been involved in retail politics, but many retired officers play leading roles in several political parties as they're entitled to do. And it's a good thing that they do spread their uh, talent amongst the parties. As a sort of a, an indication of uh, how effective this is, there was a party called the Indonesian Party of Unity and Justice, originally formed by General Asuki back in the early 1950s. Um, and then, of course, re-emerged after 1998, led by Eddie Sidrajak, who had been the Minister for Defence and Chief of the Armed Forces, then taken over by General Nasutian, and now led by Diaz Andropiano, who is a son of a, a, a retired Attorney General, still influential in the Megawati Party. But the, the last elections, just recently held, it only mustered about 0.2% of the population. And so there's obviously no support for those uh, parties who claim to represent the broader national interest and have a uh, sort of military uh, bent, if you like. Uh, but I must stress that they don't receive any support from the current military. <coughs> to help preserve their political neutrality and cohesion, neither the TNA, TNI nor the force, uh, nor the uh, police, I should say, have the right to vote. Nevertheless, the TNI retains a deeply embedded ethos that is the guardian of the state, not a mere agent of the state. The Ministry of Defence retains a military fight, uh, remains a military fighter. The commander of the uh, TNI is an ex officio member of the cabinet. The territorial commanders are members of the regional leadership uh, forums, as I mentioned before. In other words, anything the government gets involved in, they are right on their shoulder. And so it goes on down the, down the chain of the administration. And they are committed to the concept of the unitary state. Uh, that's what in Canada are right. The unitary state, basically any other form of state. They don't come along and say you want a federation or you want an Islamic state. This is what you're getting, this is what, this, this is what it's going to be. And uh, a self-sufficient defence policy requires a committed and cohesive citizen, sort of Spartan state. Hence the expanding role of the Defending the Nation indoctrination programs that the current Minister of Defence is very keen on, and they're looking to indoctrinate about 100, 100 million people over the, the, the course of this program. The TNI interests are also represented by the retired officers in Cabinet and the senior staff positions, and they carry this ethos into the people who work for the current chief of staff. President Zoltz, for example, was, was the chief of the uh, TNI about uh, two ago. And there uh, are two uh, general fronting the principal coordinated ministries in the, in the cabinet. The police are also still dependent on TNI support to secure mass mobilizations of the population and witness the recent elections and its aftermath. And still a little bit more to come now. The TNI still hankers for statutory powers for internal security and counterterrorism. And by, I mean, by that I mean they want legislation which authorises them to intervene in what they see to be threats to the state revolt. Situations like in Papua, when they think it's necessary to intervene, not when they're called out by the government. Fortunately, the government's resisted these uh, pressures so far, and so they, they have to have uh, an official call out either by the, the government or the police to get involved. But as a consequence of this uh, underground campaign, uh, it, 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 as, a, as a result of this, in the last 20 years, they haven't been able to pass formal legislation regulating, in a, in a more formal sense, the relationship between the military and the government in terms of calling them out for assistance of the civil power and civil authority. And there was recently an effort to uh, extend the placement of serving officers to non-military posts. Some of that was related to organisational incompetence and they haven't, figured, they haven't yet figured out how to lead people off as they go up the ranks because it's a different ethos. And there was an extension of retirement ages which exacerbated that. But some of it also was to no doubt get greater influence. 
The TNI is still not subject to a civil court for civil offences. And there are several MOUs to assist other ministries and agencies. And there's nothing uh, uh, illegal or irregular about that, except that it indicates the incompetence of government that you have to employ the village NCOs at that level as agricultural extension workers or to uh, you know, uh, make sure there's no reporting of rice and that sort of uh, stuff or to guard the pipelines and uh, power grids or plantations. Uh, but the TNI likes it because it actually gives them grassroots links into the population and, uh, and it extends their uh, influence across the community in general. And one of the big things they've been very successful at doing is inhibiting any accounting of past human rights abuse. Even that, that which has occurred in the, in the last 20 years. Nevertheless, it must be said that the TNI is the most respected organisation in the state uh, and is the stepping stage of political careers for some of its uh, more senior officers. By way of conclusion, the Minister and the Commander both claim that they are on track to achieve, achieve the minimum essential force by 2024. Even if the budget is doubled, time will prevent the acquisition of some major items like the number of frigates, submarines and aircraft that, uh, that would be needed within this frame time, uh, time frame, I should say, unless they are drastically to change their policy, like just buying off the shelf. Even so, the TNO will be much, in much better shape at the, uh, than it was at the beginning of this journey. In particular, it is now much better equipped to deal with internal security, maritime security, and disasters. The creation of joint service commanders commands and the integration of other critical capabilities like information warfare will also enhance their conventional capabilities in the longer term. However, the fact that indoctrination programs are still needed and that half the army remains tied down to territorial forces and that they need to be regular troops is evidence of the perceived fragility uh, of Indonesian defence policy and strategy of total people's defence. Thank you.